Uh, beat working for a living. I started in 1964 with, it, it was known as Bell Aerosystems then. It, then it became Bell Aerospace uh, before they went out of business. Um, with Bell I made, you know, and it, the, the sad thing is there's no real good record keeping. But of the, the Bell flights I have recorded, there's like 654 or 34 or something like that. And it actually had a couple of hours of flight time. Um, I don't know how many men have hours in a rocket. <laughs> but, and then uh, 1970, I went to work with uh, Nelson Tyler. And I worked from Nelson Tyler from 1970 through 1984. My last flight for Tyler was at the uh, 84 Olympics. And I thought I was hanging it up and retiring from it then, but then in 1993 I uh, went kicking and screaming into the Houston disaster and uh, made a few flights with that belt in 1995 before it disappeared. So how difficult was it to learn a rocket belt and what did the training involve? Okay, uh, first part about your question there is the reason I was hired with no aviation experience is the rocket belt originally was developed for the U.S. Army. They wanted a flying device that the average soldier could use without a lot of training. So the contract said that you had to take someone of the average conscript age, 18, 19, which I was 19, with no flight experience, and luckily I cut the inventor's lawn. He was a friend of the family, and you know I'm a shining example of how great nepotism is. And... Um, you know, here, here I am. It, it, that's the truth. You know, it's the simple truth. I'm no one special. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time and know the right people. And uh, then with the training, um, my training was interrupted quite a bit, which it shouldn't be, because uh, it's, a, it's really a pretty high brain load uh, when you're limited to 21 seconds. And it's unlike anything else you've ever experienced. You know, the, the noise and the, uh, when your feet leave the ground. It, you're so busy trying to control this monster. Also knowing that you've got to be back on the ground. You know, there's a buzzer warning system and all. But uh, it, it is intense. And you should start your training and stay at it day after day after day till you get it, not be interrupted for weeks and weeks at a time. And then uh, what was happening is there was two demonstration teams out on the road, as they say, uh, doing shows all over the world. And we were building the third and fourth belts, but while I was in training, there was still only two. So one would come back from a, a road trip and it would need refurbishing, and then it would have to be checked out by one of the you know, uh, pilots, uh, not the trainees. And once it was given a clean bill of health, then they could start training me. But, oh, oh we need it for a flight to Australia. But the other one's coming back next week. So we'll get in two or three flights next week. So all told, between when I started in March, uh, I didn't actually free fly until I think it was July, June or July of 1964. But... Uh, then I, I took to took a duck to water, really, and uh, you know it was a hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> you traveled the world, right? Yes, yes. Uh, I've been to forty-two countries, but actually flew, I think, in thirteen or fourteen. Um, some of these trips, uh, they, they always sent two pilots. One was the primary, the other the backup, in case uh, something happened, you know, get sick or. Montezuma's Revenge or something, um, the other fellow could take over. So that on some of these foreign trips, we'd only go in for one day to do one flight, and we took turns. Um, let's say we were in Sweden, but Gordon Yeager would fly that one. And then next week we're going to go over to Frankfurt. Um, so I would do it. I can count the, you know, the countries I've traveled to, but the ones I've actually flown in, I'll try to, try to give you. There was uh, Canada. Mexico, Venezuela, uh, try to take him in order, Britain, France, um, Italy, South Africa, Australia, um, I don't know, I'm not, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, the reason I was in New Zealand is uh, when we went to the Royal Melbourne show in 
65, um, Melbourne didn't have a, a runway long enough for jets yet. And Air New Zealand was one of the sponsors for bringing us down to the, the Melbourne show. So the Air New Zealand DC-8 flew into Auckland and they weren't servicing Melbourne every day of the week. So we had to lay over a few days until they had a flight going to Melbourne, which was a, an Electra because it could land on their shorter runways. So we got a, a nice few days, you know, to see Auckland and the surrounding countryside, but I loved it. Now, the rocket gun has actually been voted apparently the, the best gadget in the James Bond films. Um, uh -huh. What was, can you talk us through the stuff? You know, I know he wasn't there, the rest of the team were out in Barbados, but can you, what can you remember from, from filming that particular stunt? I, I want to give you what I try to give everyone because 99% of the people think I was the only one in that flying. And in all fairness, you know, I owe the man a great debt of gratitude, really. I, I would not have been in that film if it had not been for Gordon Yeager, who was the primary pilot for the job. I went along as the backup to pump peroxide and wait if he needed it. But he said to me, now, you know, I think I just turned 20 years old. He said, kid, this James Bond thing, now this is going to be the second Bond movie, it is going to be big. And he took out a five franc coin, he flipped it, and he said, call it. Well, he won. He said, I'll go first, you go second, we'll alternate until this is done. And I don't know why, you know, sadly, he's forgotten, never mentioned. I wouldn't have had that opportunity if he hadn't have been so generous to offer it. And I just, I have to make that point. I, I owe it to Gordy. But um, it was, uh, <laughs> I don't know if you want to hear the whole thing there quickly, but they had filmed the vast majority of Thunderball takes place in the Bahamas. We were supposed to go to Chateau Anne where this flight scene takes place. That's all of his movies open with his last caper, you know, his last quick escape. And so actually it isn't part of Thunderball, it's before the credits even start to roll, I think. And it, yeah, it's, it's, and then it goes into Thunderball and into Bahamas. Um, but they, uh, they wanted us there in March we were in Australia and South Africa at the time. We couldn't be there when they were doing the, the close-ups with Sean Connery. So they said, okay, you know, reluctantly, we'll have to shoot you guys and get on. We have a, a schedule we have to keep down in the Bahamas. So they shot all these scenes with him. They had a teeter-totter sort of thing that he stood on with a, a mock-up. And they did these tight shots from the waist up, and he'd rise up for the, the takeoff and all. And... Um, he didn't wear a helmet. He ran out on the balcony, put on his rocket belt, and took off. Well, when we got there, not only do you wear a helmet to protect your, your brains, you know, in case of an accident, but in the helmet is a vibrating buzzer that's part of the fuel, low fuel warning system. And, and you really, you know, you got to have it. It's part of the machine. And so they said, we're getting ready to fly. And they said, well, what's with the helmet? You can't wear the helmet. You know, we've shot all our work and it's all without a helmet. Well, we can't fly without a helmet. And we went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and you know, it was decided that they gotta wear a helmet. So they took brown shoe polish and took our white helmets, and they even attempted that. When you see it, he's wearing a brown helmet. Well, the brown helmet is because they were gonna try to keep the shots distant, and maybe you'd just think it was his hair. But it didn't work. So they had to, at the end of the shooting in the Bahamas, they had to bring Sean Connery back and reshoot everything with him putting on this brown helmet. And uh, it was fun. <laughs> well, now, the convention is the first and hopefully not the last. What, what, what have you made of it? What, what have you enjoyed about this convention? Today, um, Harold Graham. <laughs> I'd never met the man. You know, it's funny, he had left Bell a year and a half or so before I got there, and I've always, you know, admired the man. He was the first one. You know, it's like he's the Orville Wright of rocket belts. And what an honor it is. And then to find out he's such a card and such a, you know, a great uh, performer and sense of humor and all. Um, <laughs> you saw him in action. He's amazing. Um, but this is, it's brought all these guys together. I call them Trekkies. 
you know, these Rocket Belt enthusiasts. Uh, I am amazed, absolutely amazed that people are this involved in it. But like I, I told them yesterday, you know, you've got to get over this peroxide past and let's get on with jets. Uh, you know what we went through here a few weeks ago there with all these uh, people wanting to bomb airplanes with liquids and all, and that's all peroxide based. Um, you know, uh, uh, out of simple need, we're going to have to, you know, back off on this. Let's just quickly go back into the past. So, Olympics, biggest event probably in the world. Mm -hmm. Exhilarating experience, obviously. What was going through your mind, you know? I mean, okay. You know, it's a one-hit wonder, this one, isn't it? Yeah, um, I tried not to do that flight because I'd already told Nelson in 82, you know, that I think I did the World's Fair in 82 in Knoxville and discussed it with Nelson. I said, Nelson, look, I got seven children and uh, I, I think I've got to start giving this up. You know, I'm at the time I thought I was getting old. Hell, I'm 62 now and I don't think I'm old. Um, but... Uh, the pilot that they wanted to do it couldn't give them what they wanted, and Nelson knew I could. And I went through a couple of weeks of a lot of pressure. To, and so I finally, you know, I said, okay, I'll come and do it. But in my, that was 20 years of flying and about 1,000 flights or so, I had never fallen down or had an accident in public. In my training, my second free flight in training, I, uh, when I landed, you, you have all this weight on your back, and everybody has done it you end up with grass stains on your rear end because you sit down when you, la when you land. And so I'm up there on the, the peristyle of the Los Angeles Coliseum. You're 90 feet above the rim, and there's, the people are filling in, and, and I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know, what have I got myself into? And then the, the announcement starts, and it says, to a worldwide audience of two and one half billion people. I, I will always remember that. And I said, oh, God, don't go on your ass now. You've never done it. You know, and all of a sudden I have this dark cloud come over me. I can't, you know, I can't fail. And if you watch my landing at the Olympic flight, it was one of the worst public landings I ever made in my life. And it's because I had, my weight had risen. I was 202 pounds. Um, you know, I wasn't getting any younger. And I had never flown. I think 188 was the heaviest I ever flown at. So we were very concerned about the, you know, the power to weight ratio. So Nelson had jacked the tank pressure on the fuel up much higher than I'd ever flown. At my request, I said, I want all the power I got because number one, I got to have it to get out of here and down and do what they want done in the 19 seconds they want it done in. But what happens is you're losing two and a half pounds per second as you're flying. That's how much fuel you use. And the rocket belt has a 60% throttle. It, the minimum thrust you have is 60%, which is about 240 pounds of thrust. And there's nowhere on there where you know off is. <laughs> you could back that power down but I'm getting awful close, and uh, you know, I've, I've shut it off accidentally and on purpose on different occasions, but that was not the place to do it that day. And what happened with the higher tank pressure, I had much higher thrust, and so as I came in to land, um, I was on that hairy edge of shutting it off, but I was producing so much thrust, and I was light by 60 pounds, that I almost you know, didn't have enough minimal thrust to land it. I was getting to the point where the weight of myself and the machine ex, uh, was less than the minimum thrust so that you couldn't land. And I didn't want to chop the throttle in that last foot and have a, you know, that looks sloppy too. But I came in there and I was kind of floating and dancing around because of this enormous amount of power that I didn't want at that time. You made an analogy of um, the people behind this yeah, yeah. What, what do you think the appeal of the rocket belt is and why is there so many people out there attempting this really old technology, really? Well, it's, uh, I guess that's as close to the, the age-old dream of, you know, this Buck Rogers, uh, the power of flight. There is no large apparatus with rotors or wings or anything else and all because when you are wearing it, the only thing you see are two handles in front of you. And, and I try to tell these other guys that, have these machines, they're asking me, well, how come 
you know, we see some guys fly it and they're jerking all over this guy. I think you saw something here, uh, rough and ready. And some of the flights, you know, they've seen a, a very smooth fluid. And to get that, and I, I realized that pretty late in my, my career, you gotta get over this thinking. Don't think, you'll weaken the team, you know, I tell them. You have to put that on, strap it on, and it becomes part of your body. And you have to get this mental thing in your head that says, okay, I have the power of flight. Like riding a bicycle. When you're riding a bicycle, you don't say, well, I'm going to turn the handlebars to turn right, and I'm going to pedal harder to go uphill. You just do it without thinking about it. Many of the things you do, uh, ice skating or any of these physical things, they're after, especially people that do it a lot, they become involuntary actions of your body. And so it got where I trained myself to stop thinking about all the mechanics. Okay, I have to fly over that building, I'll go fly over that building, go do it. Once you reach that point where you get rid of all this mental garbage that's screwing up your flight, you enjoy yourself. And you do, you have the power of flight. I'm you know, devastated, I can't keep at it for longer than 20 seconds. You know, and, and, and that's when uh, I started noticing my shadow on the ground. And that, that can be disturbing because you get distracted. Um, the first time I did it, I was making a film and I was flying over buildings and the sun was behind me late in the day. And I saw my shadow going over the rooftops beneath me. And I was distracted. I started watching my shadow and not what I was doing. And then on other occasions, I made it a point to look down at my shadow. And that's, that is when you really get the idea of what you're doing. And it's like, wow, wow. And it is. It, it, it's, there's a wow factor. On that wow factor, how European and British pilot has had a bit of a, which you saw. Last He's night, the actually. greatest. <laughs> Stuart Ross, you're my hero. I'll tell him. Stuart Ross, myself, Wendell Moore are the only three people who have ever achieved horizontal flight. Not that we wanted, mind you, but we achieved horizontal flight. And if you want to show your audience, Show well, we're probably not going to show them in the news bit, but uh, so okay. what, what, do you, what do you think of, sort of Stuart's attempt and, and, and sort of, you know, it's a very American thing really, the, the rocket belt, but you know, it's Brits, you know, we're, we're, we're pitching in there and Stuart is our... Well, where the hell did we came from? We're, we're, well, that's true. We're yeah. Brits at heart. <laughs> I, I, speaking for me, uh, I love you guys, you know, we're family. But, and, and I got to tell you, I love that man. He's, he's the genuine article. He's in it for all the right reasons, and he isn't. Some of these people aren't. If you're in it to make money and get fame and get fortune, you're in it for the wrong reason. He's in it to advance the science. He is, and he believes in what he's doing. He's putting all his own personal uh, everything into this thing, and I, I applaud the man. Um, he's going to do it. He's going to make it, and he's going to get on to the next step. The convention has brought together people from the past, and the future, you may have asked this one slightly, but what has it meant to you personally, sort of, you know, meeting, you know, how, how all those people that we all thought you just talked on email and say Christmas cards, but what's it, what's it meant to you personally these two days? <laughs> well, my first impression, I, like Peter Kudzierski, I hadn't seen him since 1964, I said, where the hell are these old men come from? Fat old men, <laughs> myself included. You know, you can see how cruel time can be, but, um, I, I, I think it's absolutely great that after all these years, there's still all this interest, you know, and, and these people aren't giving up. It, it, it's amazing. So we we'll just take that bit again, who do these people aren't giving up? So I'll just ask that question again. Can we lock that? No. That's fine. Just two more questions here, and then we'll get a bit of air in it. What's it meant to you personally, meeting, reliving the, the experiences and... You know, something that really has shaped your life. Yes, it's, it, I'm going to remember this for as long as I live, however long that is. Um, I, I'm absolutely thrilled to have met Harold Graham and, you know, I had a couple of beers with him there last night and he's, uh, he's a one of a kind, a real genuine article he is. <laughs> uh, I'm proud to say that I followed in his footsteps. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't take him home to mother, thank you, but... Uh, what's, what's your gut feeling of, is there a future? Well, 
let's be you know, specific here. But, uh, yep, rocket, forget rocket. We got to get into jets. But um, there is a, a place for them. There is a need for them. Uh, watching last year, uh, the uh, devastation there, Hurricane Katrina with the helicopters can't get down to get the people due to different obstructions or whatever, and they got to lower the cables. And um, you're not going to see it as a backpack flying belt, but a small, uh, pure thrust like the Williams X-Jet. Uh, where the hell are the people that should be doing this? Um, the X-Jet 2 flies with a little bucket seat on the back of it as a rescue vehicle. It can be flown on autonomous, you know, without even a pilot to rescue down people. Uh, and shame on you, United States government, for not funding this because, uh, you know, let's quit building so damn many weapons and start building some of these things, uh, you know, to help people. And I, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not some, you know, flag-burning wacko, uh, but I think our priorities are turned upside down uh, in a lot of the sciences, not just this one. 